August 1942, Guadalcanal. 16,000 U.S. Marines had just captured a vital Japanese airfield. On paper, this was an absolute triumph. But the moment the first tropical rainstorm hit, they realized they hadn't captured a prize. They had walked straight into a deadly trap. The runway, a cleared strip of jungle, instantly dissolved. It was instantly transformed into a thick, bottomless soup of chocolate pudding mud. When the first U.S. fighter planes, the Cactus Air Force, arrived, they didn't land. They sank. Mechanics watched in horror as landing gear struts vanished into the muck. A desperate wildcat, scrambling to intercept an incoming raid, dug trenches four feet deep before it could even move, grounded before it ever flew. The Marines were stranded. Their air cover was drowning in the mud. The Japanese were bombing them daily, and their ships were shelling them nightly. The real enemy wasn't the one with the guns. It was the ground itself. Back in Washington, the Army Corps of Engineers is in a panic. The reports from the Pacific are a nightmare. They need a runway that can be built in days, not months. A runway that can be shipped 10,000 miles, assembled by exhausted men with no tools, and survive typhoons. They had tried everything. Concrete? Takes months to pour and cure. Crushed coral? It washes away in the first rain. They tried laying down burlap soaked in asphalt, but it tore apart after 10 landings. They tried steel plates, but they warped and buckled under the tropical sun, turning the runway into a deadly washboard. Every conventional solution had failed. America's entire Pacific strategy was about to be defeated by mud. Then, an engineer at Carnegie, Illinois Steel, named James Marston, looked at all the failures and had a revolutionary, counterintuitive idea. Everyone was trying to fight the mud to pave over it, to compact it, to defeat it. Marston's idea was simple. Don't fight the mud, float on top of it. He didn't design a road, he designed a metal carpet. A flexible, interlocking system of steel planks that would distribute the 30-ton weight of a bomber over such a wide area that the soft ground underneath could easily support it. The design was genius in its simplicity. Each plank was 10 feet long, 15 inches wide, and weighed just 66 pounds, light enough for two men to carry. It had three outlier features that made it a miracle. The holes. The planks were perforated with 87 holes. This wasn't just to save weight, it allowed water to drain through the runway, preventing hydroplaning. And the punched edges gave aircraft tires a desperate grip in the wet. The hooks. One side had a simple hook, the slots. The other side had a simple slot. You just laid a plank down, brought the next one in, and with a simple tilt and a drop, it clicked into place. No bolts, no welds, no specialized tools, just a click that locked the planks together. Strong enough to handle a bomber, but flexible enough to float on the soft ground like a giant steel raft. Back on Guadalcanal, the first shipments of Marston Matt arrive on a beach while Zeros are strafing the shoreline. The Seabees, America's legendary construction battalions, had never seen this stuff before. They were carpenters and steel workers, not runway builders. They grabbed the 66-pound planks and went to work, under constant enemy fire. Two men would haul a plank, a third would line up the hook and slot, then click. They'd run back for another, click, click, click. It was a frantic race. When the air raid sirens wailed, they'd dive into foxholes. When the bombs stopped, they'd climb back out and keep building. If a bomb blew a crater in their new runway, they'd fill the hole with coral, unlock the damaged planks, and click new ones into place in under 40 minutes. In just 48 hours, they had laid down a 200-foot section. It was enough. The first Wildcat fighters, the saviors of Guadalcanal, landed on a runway that didn't exist two days earlier. By September 5th, they had a 5,200-foot runway, built while the battle was still raging. The mud had been defeated. This simple, 66-pound steel plank changed the entire Pacific War. The Japanese strategy was to make every island a fortress that would take months of costly construction to make useful. The Marston Mat broke that timeline. At Munda Point, CBs laid a runway in 11 days 
while under direct sniper fire. At Bougainville, they pre-assembled giant sections and laid a full runway in just four days. America could now island hop at a terrifying speed, building instant airfields faster than the Japanese could even react. The B-29 raids that would end the war were launched from runways on Saipan and Tinian runways built in weeks with this magic carpet. It was the unglamorous, unsexy, and most important weapon of the war. It was used on the beaches of Normandy to stop tanks from sinking in the sand. It was used in Korea, in Vietnam, and is still used today in disaster zones like Haiti to build instant runways for relief planes. The war in the Pacific wasn't just won by carriers or bombers. It was won by a brilliantly simple piece of steel that taught America how to turn a worthless patch of mud into a highway to victory. Make sure you look at a dress-thin weapon to get these jobs lengths. In 48 hours,